Say now that you want to animate your canvas. One way of going about this is to create a function like animate here. Animate takes one argument, and that is the number of the frame at which to start drawing. So here, immediately after creating the animate function, we then invoke it with an argument of zero, because presumably we're using zero-based indexing for our frames, so zero is the first frame, and we're starting our animation off from the first frame. In the function, the first thing we do is call another function, draw frame, which does the actual business of drawing the frame, given the number of the frame. Uh, then we increment frame and recursively call animate to draw the next frame. Now, there are two problems with this arrangement. First off, it is infinitely recursive. We will draw frame 0, then 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, and so on, off into infinity. The other problem with this arrangement is that the frames now will be drawn one after the other with no break in between. So they're just drawn as fast as your code executes, which very likely is faster than you actually want. In an animation, you generally want the frames to come at regular intervals, such that there are 12 frames per second, or 20 frames, or 24 frames, or whatever. And those frames should be evenly spaced. To solve our first problem, we simply declare a constant num frames that declares the number of frames, and then only call animate recursively when frame is still less than that number. To address the timing issue, we use window.setTimeout, which is a standard method in the browser to which we supply a function and a number of milliseconds, and then the browser will invoke that function after that number of milliseconds has passed. So here the function we pass to set timeout invokes animate with the next frame, and this function will get invoked 20 milliseconds after we call window.setTimeout. Or, more accurately, it will wait at least 20 milliseconds. The way that the processes and the timers in your system work, it's not possible to guarantee for something to run at some absolute time. The browser can only guarantee that it will wait at least 20 milliseconds before invoking this function. But if there are other things going on in the system that are monopolized in the CPU, um, then it may be sometime after that 20 milliseconds has passed before your function gets a chance to run. In practice, though, this arrangement will work reasonably well, and the function will usually get invoked uh, very soon after the timer expires. So, if we wait 20 milliseconds between each frame, well, there are 50 20 millisecond intervals in one second, so that means here that we are going to draw at the most 50 frames per second. More likely something a little bit less than that, but quite close to it. An even better way of handling animations is to use a recently introduced method called window.requestAnimationFrame. This is actually currently an experimental feature in the browsers, uh, so it actually isn't known by this name yet. In Firefox, for example, it's actually prefixed with moz. It's moz request animation frame, not just request animation frame. And in Chrome, it's WebKit request animation frame. In any case, the idea of how this works is you pass to it a function for the browser to invoke the next time the browser is ready to draw another frame of animation. That callback function receives as argument the current time, and by comparing that time against the time you recorded when you drew the previous frame of animation, you can figure out first if you need to, as of yet, draw another frame of animation, and if so, which frame should you draw. The advantages of this method is that the browser is smart about not calling your function too often. It will call it, I believe, up to a maximum of 60 times per second, and it also can lead to greater efficiency by synchronizing your draws with reflows of the whole page. Every time an element changes on the page, that triggers a reflow and repaint cycle to redraw the whole page, which is really quite expensive. If you can synchronize the changes you make to the canvas with the rest of that cycle, um, then that leads to greater efficiency. The other advantage of request animation frame is that the browser is smart about not invoking it uh, as often or not at all when your browser tab is in the background. Obviously, if your browser tab isn't even visible on the screen, then there's no way the canvas is visible so there's no reason to update your animation. So this will spare your system wasted CPU cycles, and if you're on a mobile device especially, it'll, it'll spare you some battery life too. So here's an example of what the code might look like. Our callback function animate takes one parameter time, and we'll pass to our draw frame function the time, and presumably then it's the responsibility of draw frame to decide whether or not it needs to draw a new frame and which frame to draw. And then the important thing to understand this is that window request animation frame will only invoke the callback once. So because here we're not just drawing one frame, we're drawing an animation, we want our callback function to register itself again with request animation frame. 
And of course, if you have a limited animation, an animation that stops at some point, you might put in a condition that makes this re-registering of the callback conditional, so that at some point it stops re-registering itself. Because drawing to the canvas can be quite expensive, especially when drawing animations, you should keep in mind two general performance guidelines. The first rule is to minimize the number of draw operations. That is, if you can produce the same result with fewer method calls, that quite likely will produce better performance. And the second guideline is to do your drawing, especially your complex drawing, where you do have a lot of draw operations that you can't avoid, do that on some off-screen canvas, some canvas element which you just create in your JavaScript code, don't actually put on the page, draw there first, and then when you want to render it into a canvas on the page, use the draw image method to copy the content of the off-screen canvas onto the canvas that's actually on the page. The advantage of this is that you can construct your image, and each method you call isn't going to trigger a reflow and repaint cycle. Your draw operations are only affecting data in memory. They don't actually have to be rendered to the screen until we actually render to the canvas that's actually on the page. This technique also helps you avoid the user seeing any intermediate images, like say, if you want to update to the next frame and you need to do so with 10 draw operations, well, as you go through those operations, the user might see those operations being done one by one, even if they're done very quickly, so you may end up with a sort of flickering effect on your canvas. Doing all your rendering to an off-screen canvas first avoids that problem. What's called a scene graph is a logical representation of 2D or 3D objects in space. Like, for example, you see here a bunch of shapes layered on top of each other, and then there's this background image behind it all of, I don't know what that is, planet Neptune or something, blue planet. When we construct an image like this on the canvas, we draw uh, back to front. We start with the background and then at, draw the layers on top. However, once we've done all our drawing, the canvas retains no sense of, well, this is a shape here, and this is a square there, and that's a circle here. It doesn't understand that part at all. It's just this big array of pixels. The idea of the scene graph, though, is that you construct your scene by logically saying, well, there's a square here at this coordinate, it's rotated this angle, it's this color, and it's layered on top of this other image, and behind it there's a background. And then the idea of the scene graph is you have some library layer which is then responsible for actually producing a canvas from that graph. So a scene graph is a kind of abstraction layer. As someone who wants to draw something onto a page, I want to describe it in terms of, well, there's this image here, and it's rotated like this at this position, and there's something else on top of it here, and I want to be able to move these things around on the canvas, and I want to leave it up to an abstraction layer to doing the actual drawing. This sort of abstraction is actually quite critical in something like a game. In the code for your game, whether it's two-dimensional or three-dimensional, you want your game logic to deal with discrete entities which exist in some 2D or three-dimensional space. You don't want to have to deal with a bunch of pixels. The pixels, the actual rendering, should be generated from a snapshot of the state of your game world. Now, you can, of course, always create this abstraction layer yourself, but there are some freely available scene graph libraries out there, like, for instance, one called ConnectJS, where I found this particular example. Finally, there are a few details of the canvas we alighted over, like, say, when drawing lines, you can set a property that determines how the ends of the lines are drawn, whether they're rounded or square, and you can also specify how the joins of the lines are drawn, that is, when you create an angle between two lines, what does the join at the angle look like? Is it rounded or just square or what? We also didn't see any examples of what are called patterns or gradients, which, as I mentioned, are alternatives to specifying colors when you draw shapes or draw text. Nor did we look at how to draw drop shadows, which is something you can do, I believe, with any draw operation, whether you're drawing lines or shapes or text or actually even, I think, rendering images, though I'm not sure about that last one. We did mention in passing the transform matrix, which is the actual math behind uh, how transformations are accomplished. For the sake of 2D graphics, you don't really have to understand the transform matrix, though when it comes to 3D graphics, you probably do have to break down and delve into a little bit of linear algebra to really understand what's going on. Finally, associated with each canvas is what's called an origin clean flag. This has to do with the browser's same site origin policy, which is a security mechanism that protects against cross-site scripting attacks. The gist of this is that when a canvas is created, its origin clean flag is set to true, but if by some means 
data that comes from some other domain, some domain other than that of the page itself, then the origin clean flag will be set to false, and this then disallows certain calls on the context, which would read data from the canvas. Namely, the getImageData method will throw an exception if the origin clean flag is set to false. So, for example, if your page is served from the domain example.com, but you draw to your canvas an image resource from some other domain, that will set the origin clean flag to false, and then you'll get an exception if you try and read the data of the pixels with the getImageData method. To understand why the browser allowing you to do otherwise would be dangerous, you'd have to understand the dangers of cross-site scripting attacks, which I won't go into here.